On June 7, Karl Erich Kulenthal sent a message to Juan Puyol asking his star spy to find out whether the British were recruiting Greek soldiers in preparation for the assault. The 1st Canadian Division was already training in Scotland and preparing to embark for Sicily. Kulenthal assumed they were heading for Greece. Try to find out if Greek troops are stationed close to the 1st Canadian Army or elsewhere in the south of England, and if so, which Greek troops are these, wrote Kulenthal. It is of greatest importance to discover the next operation. Garbo told his handler that Agent No. 5, a wealthy Venezuelan student, would immediately head to Scotland to investigate the presence of Greek troops. The Greek troops did not exist, of course, but then neither did Agent No. 5. The Germans had clearly taken the bait, but they would also be watching closely for any evidence confirming or disproving what they now believed. Dudley Clark sent a message suggesting that the only serious danger of the deception being uncovered would be a legal or illegal exhumation with a view to a more thorough autopsy on the body in the Huelva Cemetery. Montague arranged another meeting with the St. Pancras coroner, Bentley Purchase, who reassured him that an autopsy at this late stage would probably be inconclusive. By the time that he had been buried for a short period, his internal organs must have been, according to the coroner, in a very mixed-up condition, and the lungs would probably have been liquefied, making it even harder to establish death by drowning. Montague sent a message to Bevan. Although no one in this world can be certain of anything, it does not seem that the fear that the Germans may learn anything from a disinterment and subsequent autopsy is well-founded. Still, a large slab of engraved marble might help to discourage any grave-robbing, while giving William Martin the sort of dignified gravestone he deserved. On May 21st, Alan Hillgarth received an encoded message from London, suggest, unless unusual, that a medium-priced tombstone should be erected on grave with inscriptions such as, quote, William Martin, born 29th March 1907, died 24, repetition, 24 April 1943, Beloved son of John Glindower, repetition, Glindower Martin, and the late Antonia Martin of Cardiff, Wales. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. R.I.P. End quote. Montague spelled Glindower Michael's first name wrong in his cable. The arrow was duly transferred to the stone. For a moment, the spies had second thoughts. Would a large marble gravestone look suspicious? This to be done unless restrictions on making payment from England to Spain or other wartime difficulties would have made it too difficult for a father to get this done in normal circumstances. Hilgarth replied immediately, Please send me ordinary cipher signal, saying that relations would like this stone put up, telling me to get on with it. I will then get exchange in normal way and proceed immediately. Germany's spies within the British Embassy could be relied on to pick up the message and relay it to the Abwehr in the usual way. In a final element of stage design, the mincemeat team wrote, Suggest Consul place wreath now, with card marked, quote, From Father and Pam, end quote. Mario Toscana, the Huelva gravestone carver, was instructed to make the stone as fast as possible. Francis Hazelden sent the wreath as instructed, as well as several bouquets picked from the garden of the Casa Colon, the headquarters of the Rio Tinto Company. The purpose of this was not only to carry out what would probably have occurred in real life, but also to enable the grave to be visited often enough to discourage any chance of a secret and illicit disinterment for further autopsy. Lancelot Shute, Hazelden's sidekick, would make a daily pilgrimage to the graveside, ostensibly as an official mourner, in reality, to see if the flowers had been moved and the grave disturbed. Hilgarth composed and dictated a letter, addressed to John G. Martin Esquire, but for the attention of Kulenthal and his spies. Sir, in accordance with instructions from the Admiralty, I have now arranged for a gravestone for your son's grave. It will be a simple white marble slab with the inscription which you sent to me through the Admiralty, and the cost will be 900 pesetas. The grave itself cost 500 pesetas, and, as I think you know, it is in the Roman Catholic cemetery. A wreath with a card on it with the message you asked for has been laid on the grave. 
The flowers came from the garden of an English mining company in Huelva. I have taken the liberty of thanking the vice-consul, Huelva, on your behalf for all he has done. May I express my deep sympathy with you and your son's fiancé in your great sorrow. I am, sir, your obedient servant, Alan Hilgarth. At the same time, Montague sent a message to Hilgarth with the same audience in mind. I have been asked by Major Martin's father, fiancé and friends, to thank you for the trouble you and the vice-consul have taken in connection with his funeral, and to say how much they appreciate the promptitude with which you returned his personal effects, few though they were. As Major Martin was an only son and just engaged to be married, they will be greatly treasured. Here was confirmation for the Germans that all Martin's accoutrements were safely back in Britain. Could you possibly procure for him a photograph of the grave after the tombstone has been erected? Hilgarth duly obliged. As far as the Germans knew, the British authorities were deeply relieved to get their valuable documents back intact. Another small outlay by Hilgarth would bolster that impression, by way of local gossip. A reasonable reward of not more than twenty-five pounds should be given to the person who handed the papers to the safe custody of naval authorities. It is left to your judgment whether this should be done by you, through naval authorities, or by Consul Huelva Direct. The sum of twenty-five pounds was a small fortune in wartime Huelva. José Rey's fishing trip would turn out to be the most lucrative of his life. While Pam and father grieved in private, the news of Major William Martin's death now needed relaying to a wider public audience. The Germans had access to the British casualty lists, and if Martin's name failed to appear on them, suspicions might be aroused. At least equal suspicion might be provoked among Royal Marines officers if one of their number was suddenly declared dead without warning. A letter, marked Most Secret and Personal, was sent to the commanders of the three Royal Marines divisions, as well as the colonel who edited the Globe and Laurel, the official Marines newsletter. No action is to be taken in respect of the notification of the death of Major William Martin. This officer was detached on special service, and no mention will be made in general orders. The casualty section received a curt order. Insert the following entry in the next suitable casualty list. Temporary Captain, Acting Major, William Martin, R.M. This should appear at the earliest possible moment. But it was not so easy to slip a false death past the authorities. The Department of the Medical Director General later demanded to know whether Major Martin had died in action, and if so, how. The Navy's legal department wanted to know if the gallant Major had left a will. And, if so, where was it? Both departments were politely but firmly told to mind their own business. The announcement of Major William Martin's death on active service duly appeared in the Times on Friday, June 4, 1943. By pure chance, the names of two other rear naval officers, whose deaths in an aircraft accident had previously been reported in the newspaper, appeared on the same list. The Germans, Montague speculated, might link the reported death of Martin with that accident. The death of Leslie Howard, distinguished film and stage actor, was reported in a new story alongside the Roll of Honor featuring W. Martin. The civilian plane carrying the actor had been shot down by a German fighter over the Bay of Biscay. Somewhat eerily, an obvious informant may have mistaken Howard for Winston Churchill, who had recently visited Algiers and Tunis. It is safe to assume that more public attention was paid to this severe loss to the British theatre and to British films than to the obscure death of a soldier whom no one, bar a few spies, had ever heard of. The Times was the place all important people wanted to be seen dead in, and it's not possible to be deader than in the death columns of Britain's most venerable newspaper. That said, several people have been pronounced dead in the press while being very much alive— including Robert Graves, Ernest Hemingway, Mark Twain, twice, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. In July 1900, George Morrison, the Peking correspondent of the Times, read of his own death in his own newspaper after he was believed to have perished during the Boxer Rebellion. The obituary described him as devoted and fearless. A friend remarked, The only decent thing they can do now is double your salary. They didn't. This, however, was the first time in the newspaper's history that a person was formally pronounced dead without ever having been alive. At the end of May, the Director of Naval Intelligence noted in his secret diary that the 1st German Panzer Division, strength about 18,000 men, 
is being transferred from France to the Salonica region. The information was graded A1. This was the first indication of a major troop movement in response to the mincemeat papers. An intercepted message added further details of the arrangements for the passage through Greece to Tripolis in the Peloponnese of the 1st German Panzer Division. The movement seemed directly linked to the information in Nye's letter, since Tripolis, Montague noted, was a strategic position well suited to resist our invasion of Kalamata and Caparaxos. The 1st Panzer Division, with 83 tanks, had seen fierce action in Russia, but was now completely re-equipped. Last located by British intelligence in Brittany, the Panzer Troop was a formidable hardened force, and it was now being rolled from one end of Europe to the other, to counter an illusion. On June 8th, Montague wrote an interim report on the progress of Operation Mincemeat. It is now about halfway between the time when the documents in Mincemeat reached the Germans and the present D-Day for Operation Husky, and I have therefore considered the state of the Germans' mind in so far as we have evidence. Montague summarized the intercepted messages, known troop movements, diplomatic gossip, and double agent feedback, all of which suggested the most gratifying progress. The present situation is summed up in the June 7th message to Garbo, which to my mind indicates the Germans are still accepting the probability of an attack in Greece, and are still anxiously searching for the target we foreshadowed in the Western Mediterranean. Goebbels remained silent on the subject, but whatever other suspicions there may have been on the German side now seemed to be allayed. They raised but did not pursue the question of whether it was a plot. Mincemeat has already resulted in some dispersal of the enemy's effort and forces, Montague wrote. It is to be hoped that, as visible signs in the eastern Mediterranean increase, the story we have put over may be confirmed and lead the enemy to take their eye off Sicily still more, although they obviously cannot entirely neglect the reinforcement of so vulnerable and imminently threatened a point. It already appears to be having the desired effect on the enemy and, as the preparations for Husky grow, its effect may become cumulative. There was still time for Mincemeat to go horribly wrong, but so far Major Martin's secret mission was going swimmingly. Montague's interim report declared, I think that at this halfway stage, Mincemeat can still be regarded as achieving the objective for which we hoped. Chapter 20 Seraph and Husky Bill Jewell steered the Seraph toward the jagged silhouette of the coastline as the wind whipped and wailed around the conning tower. It was past ten o'clock, and curtains of thick fog draped an irritable sea, the rear guard of a nasty summer storm. Jewell shivered inside his sou'wester. The weather, he reflected, was moderately vile, but the reduced visibility would work to his advantage. Once again the Seraph was creeping toward the southern coast of Europe in the darkness, to drop off an important item. Once again she had been entrusted with a mission of profound secrecy and extreme danger. Once again the lives of thousands depended on her success. The difference between this mission and the one successfully executed three months earlier was that the canister in the hold really did contain scientific instruments— a homing beacon to guide the largest invasion force ever assembled to the shores of Sicily. Having played her part in the secret build-up to Husky, the Seraph had been selected to lead the invasion itself. A week earlier, Jewel had been summoned to submarine headquarters in Algiers, and briefed by his commanding officer, Captain Barney Fawkes, you are to act as guide and beacon submarine for the army's invasion of Sicily. Jewel's mission would be to drop a new type of buoy containing a radar beacon 1,000 yards off the beach at Gela, on the island's south coast, just a few hours before D-Day. July 10th, 0400 hours. Destroyers, leading flotillas of landing craft carrying the troops of America's 45th Infantry Division, would lock on to the homing beacon, and the assault troops would then storm ashore in the early hours of the Sicilian morning. Seraph should remain in position as a visible beacon for the first waves of the invasion force, and retire once the attack was under way. The British submarine would act as the spearhead for a mighty host, an armada of Homeric proportions, more than 3,000 freighters, frigates, tankers, transports, minesweepers, and landing craft, carrying 1,800 heavy guns, 400 tanks, and an invasion force of 160,000 Allied soldiers, composed of the United States 7th Army under General George Patton, 
and Montgomery's British Eighth Army. Sicily may be the most thoroughly invaded place on earth. From the 8th century BC, the island has been attacked, occupied, plundered, and fought over by successive waves of invaders. Greeks, Romans, Vandals, Phoenicians, Carthaginians, Ostrogoths, Byzantines, Saracens, Normans, Spaniards, and British. But never had Sicily witnessed an invasion on this scale. If Operation Mincemeat had succeeded, then Allied troops would face only limited resistance. Duell had no idea whether his strange cargo had ever reached the coast of Huelva, but as he absorbed his new orders, he found himself wondering whether the dead body had delivered his false information to the Germans, and whether, as a result, the thousands of troops preparing to assault the island would meet less resistance. If the ruse had failed and tipped off the Axis to the real target of Operation Husky, then the Seraph might be leading the vast floating host into catastrophe. After receiving his orders, Jewell had reported to the Seventh Army headquarters for a briefing from General Patton himself. Swaggering, foul-mouthed, and inspirational, Patton was a born leader of men and a deeply divisive figure. Jewell detested him on sight. With a pearl-handled revolver on each hip, the General strode around the briefing room, barking orders at Jewell and the two other British submarine commanders who would help guide in the American ground troops— his force was to land in three parts, each on its own beach. He wanted reconnaissance checked and the submarines allocated to the beaches to stay in their position over the Beacon Boys to ensure that the right forces landed on the right beaches. The briefing lasted all of ten minutes. He was really very short with us, somewhat conceited and very rudely outspoken, Jewell recalled. Outside the conference room, Jewell had a loud American voice call his name and turned to find Colonel Bill Darby of the U.S. Army Rangers, his friend from the earlier Galita reconnaissance. Darby explained that he would be leading his troops ashore in Seraph's wake, at the head of Force X, made up of two crack ranger battalions. Do as good a job for us as you did at Galita, said Darby, and we'll be mighty grateful. Jewell promised to do his best, yet the submarine commander was privately apprehensive. If the enemy spotted the Seraph laying the beacon boy, it would certainly realize that an invasion was imminent, and rush reinforcements to that section of the coast. Discovery, Jewell reflected, would throw the whole husky plan into jeopardy. Dwight Eisenhower himself had warned that if the Germans were tipped off, the attack on Sicily would fail. The American general told Churchill, If substantial German ground troops should be placed in the region prior to the attack, the chances for success become practically nil, and the project should be abandoned. Even a few hours' warning would be paid for in greatly increased bloodshed. Surprise was essential. Lack of it was potentially fatal. Patton's closing remark also stuck in Jewell's mind, both irritating and alarming him. The submarines would be less than a mile from the enemy, but come what may, they must stay there until the task force with the army arrived, no matter how late. Seraph, codenamed Sent, would be left on the surface as the sun rose, isolated and defenceless a sitting duck for the Italian guns ranged along the coast. This was undoubtedly Jewell's most dangerous mission, with every probability that it might also be his last. Jewell was sublimely indifferent to his own safety. He had faced danger and discomfort on an extravagant scale in a gruesome war. Time after time he had demonstrated his willingness to die. But now he had something new to live for. Bill Jewell had fallen in love. After performing his part in Operation Mincemeat, Jewell had returned to Algiers for some well-earned shore leave. Among the new arrivals at Allied headquarters in the city was Rosemary Galloway, a young officer in the Rennes, the Women's Royal Naval Service. Rosemary was a cipher clerk, coding and decoding the messages passing in and out of Allied headquarters, and thus was privy to secret and sensitive information. She was vivacious, intelligent, and exceedingly attractive. Jewell and Rosemary had met once before in Britain, and in the sultry heat of wartime Algiers, that acquaintance rapidly bloomed into romance. Once Rosemary was in Bill Jewell's emotional periscope, he pursued her with unswerving determination. She proved a most cooperative quarry. There were limited opportunities for courtship in wartime Algiers, and Jewell seized all of them. At Sidi Barouk, just outside the city, the American forces had created a rest camp that was the nearest thing in Algeria to an American country club with bar, restaurant, tennis court, and swimming pool. 
Jewell recalled, The American High Command had taken possession of a strip of beach and olive grove and converted it into an Arabian night's dream, barring the Huris, of course. Actually, these were available too. An evening at Sidi Baruch was, in Jules' words, a really deluxe experience. Jules' friendly relations with senior American officers earned him access to this most exclusive spot, and even the use of an American driver, one private Pochicchio, a Brooklyn native who drove with one leg permanently hanging out of his jeep. When Bochicchio was unavailable, Jewel squired Rosemary around town in an ancient hillman acquired by the Eighth Flotilla and known as the Wren Trap, less for its romantic allure, which was zero, than for its captive potential. None of the doors opened from the inside, and no matter how urgent the need for fresh air, Wrens who accepted the risk had to rely on the chivalry of their companions to release them. Bochicchio, who had picked up some fruity British slang, was scathing about the wren trap and what went on in it. Bloody heap ain't got no springs left. The Hotel St. George was the best hotel in Algiers and Eisenhower's headquarters. Built on the site of an ancient Moorish palace, it was surrounded by botanical gardens with hibiscus, roses, and flowering cacti. In both war and peace, visitors sipped cocktails in the shade of vast umbrellas beneath the palms and banana trees, served by Algerian waiters in starched uniforms with epaulets. The hotel chef, in Jules' estimation, could turn out a meal, even in the depleted Algiers of that day, in keeping with the finest traditions of French cuisine. Rudyard Kipling, André Gide, Simon de Beauvoir, and King George V of England all stayed at the St. George. On June 7, 1943, the hotel hosted the crucial conference at which Churchill and Eisenhower finalized plans for the Allied invasion of Sicily. That same month, it was the setting for the culmination of Jules' campaign to win Rosemary Galloway. For two joyful weeks, he had wooed her with every weapon at his disposal. French food, an American swimming pool, and a British car with doors that wouldn't open. Rosemary was in no mind to resist, and at the end of this sustained bombardment she had sunk unresistingly into Lieutenant Jules' arms. It was therefore with even more than his usual alertness that Jules scanned the foggy seas off the Sicilian coast at midnight on July 9th. He had captured Rosemary Galloway's heart, and he did not intend to lose his prize by getting killed. If mincemeat had failed, or worse, had backfired, then Jewel, his crew, and the thousands of British and American troops streaming into battle behind him might not live through the next few hours. If the plan had worked then perhaps he would see Rosemary again. Jewel was surprised at how much this mattered to him. Before meeting Rosemary, Jewel had not cared very much whether he lived or died. Now, he discovered, he cared very much indeed. The crew of the Seraph had already laid out a trail of small marker boys, each primed with a fuse that would set off simultaneous blinker lights in exactly four hours to lead the flotilla to shore. The heavier beacon boy was brought up on deck, and the submarine slowly edged toward the drop point. Jewel was about to give the order to lower the boy, when the lookout's hushed voice cut through the darkness, "'E boat on port quarter, sir!' The German Schnellboot, known to the Allies as the E-boat, was a motor torpedo launch, with three 2,000-horsepower Daimler-Benz engines, carrying four torpedoes, two 20-millimeter cannons, and six machine guns. It was better armed and three times faster than the Seraph and it was about four hundred yards away, motionless, a clearly visible silhouette standing out blackly against the dark blueness of the night. The e-boat had also spotted the British submarine, and was attempting to determine whether it was friend or foe. It was a ticklish moment, wrote Jewel. That Nazi, I knew, was faster than we and much better armed. I knew her gunners were at battle stations, manning their weapons and waiting for the word to fire. For what seemed like minutes, but was only seconds, Jewel waited tensely for the e-boat to make its move. At a whispered order, the submarine's gun crews and torpedo men moved to action stations. If the Germans attacked, the Seraph would have to try to fight it out. Even if he won that duel, the coastal defenders would be alerted to what was coming over the dark horizon. Jewel knew that then the fat would have been in the fire. The British submarine lay low in the water, and the swirling fog made identification doubly difficult. The German captain was plainly undecided about her identity, 
expecting only friendly submarines so near his coast. Suddenly he flashed his navigation lights. I knew that would be a recognition signal of some sort that I'd be expected to answer immediately. The German captain's challenge gave Jewel the vital few seconds he needed. The decks were cleared, the boy manhandled below, and the hatch slammed shut, and Jewel barked the order to dive. Down she went in a few seconds. To the enemy she must have seemed literally to vanish. With luck, reflected Jewel, the encounter would not tip off the defenders to the impending invasion. The captain of the e-boat would still be victim to his own indecision, and so long as he couldn't be sure whether we were friend or enemy, it was not likely the Germans would take alarm. But time was short. The boy would have to be laid within the next hour, for the mighty Allied army of invasion was now only a few hours away, strung out in a vast flotilla just over the horizon to the south. The broad plan for the invasion of Sicily had been agreed at Casablanca back in January 1943, but the process of working out the specifics of Operation Husky had turned into a dogfight, with intense disagreements among commanders and rising tensions between the British and American allies. Patton found Montgomery wonderfully conceded, and noted that General Alexander, the commander of the Allied ground forces, had an exceptionally small head. This from a man whose big-headedness was legendary. Montgomery said of Eisenhower, his knowledge of how to make war or to fight battles is definitely nil. The British general flatly refused to accept Eisenhower's initial battle plans, which called for an American invasion in the west of Sicily aimed at Palermo, while the British took Augusta and Syracuse on the southeast coast. Monty insisted that he knew better, which he did, and predicted a military disaster if the plan was not scrapped. Montgomery was adept at tactical manoeuvres. He finally got his way after cornering Major General Walter Bedell Smith, Eisenhower's chief of staff, in the toilets at Allied Forces headquarters in Algiers. First at the urinal, then by drawing a map of Sicily on the steamy mirror above the wash basin, Montgomery laid out his alternative plan, a consolidated assault on the southeast coast by both armies. Agreement was reached. Before dawn on July 10th, Patton's 7th Army would assault the coast at the Gulf of Gela, while Montgomery's 8th Army would storm ashore farther east at the Gulf of Noto and Casibale. In all, some 26 beaches would be attacked along 100 miles of Sicily's southern coast by troops assembled in the ports of Algeria, Tunisia, Libya and Egypt. The invasion would be preceded by intensive bombing of Sicilian airfields. Immediately before the assault, paratroopers would drop behind enemy lines to sever communications, forestall counterattacks, secure vital road junctions, and confuse the enemy. The combined chiefs approved the plan for Operation Husky on May 12th, the very day that London intercepted the first message, indicating that Hitler had seen, and believed, the documents in Major Martin's briefcase. The logistics of the operation would have boggled most minds. The American contingent alone called for 6.6 .6 million sets of rations, 5,000 crated airplanes, 5,000 carrier pigeons and accompanying pigeoneers, and a somewhat unambitious 144,000 condoms, fewer than two each. The task of assembling this plethora of gear was rendered yet more complex by the need for absolute secrecy. Amphibious landings are notoriously hard as Gallipoli and Dieppe attested. They are all but impossible if the defenders are ready and waiting. Eisenhower was insistent on the paramount importance of surprise, predicting that the operation would fail if more than two divisions were waiting and the defenders put up strong resistance. The Germans could hardly fail to spot the 160,000 soldiers and 3,000 boats assembling on the north coast of Africa. The key would be to keep them guessing as to where exactly the attack might come. Once the offensive was underway, a secondary deception plan, Operation Derrick, would try to convince the enemy that the assault on the south was diversionary, and the real attack would still come in the west of Sicily, keeping more troops out of the battle zone. Maps of Sicily were kept under lock and key. The soldiers of the invasion force would not be told where they were going until the task force was at sea. Letters home were strictly censored to ensure that the intended target remained secret, with officers only half-joking when they instructed their men that when writing home, you cannot, you must not, be interesting. Yet word inevitably had leaked out, onto the docks of North Africa. 
The soldier's guide to Sicily was accidentally distributed too early. A British officer in Cairo sent his uniform to be cleaned with the husky battle plans in the pocket. The papers were retrieved, but not before several pages had been used to write out customer invoices. Somewhere in Cairo was a person with clean clothes and the Allies' most secret plans. Still more alarmingly, Colonel Knox of the British 1st Airborne Division had accidentally left a top-secret cable on the terrace of the Shepherd Hotel in Cairo. The document gave not only the date and time of the Sicily invasion, but also the timing for the dropping of paratroops, and even the availability of aircraft and gliders for such operations. The paper was missing for at least two days, before the hotel manager returned it to the military authorities. Dudley Clark was confident, however, that if it had fallen into enemy hands, through such an obvious and gross breach of security, then it would probably be dismissed as a plant, pointing to Sicily as the cover target in accordance with mincemeat. He concluded that Colonel Knox may well have assisted, rather than hindered us. Operation Barclay, the overall deception plan to disguise Allied intentions and to keep as many Axis forces as possible away from Sicily, reached a climax in the days leading up to July 10th. Submarines had dropped men on the coasts of Sardinia and the Greek island of Zante, to leave behind unmistakable signs of reconnaissance for the Germans to find, as if in preparation for major assaults. Operation Waterfall, simulating the gathering of an army in the eastern Mediterranean as if to invade the Balkans, assembled huge numbers of dummy tanks and planes. SOE organized a genuine sabotage operation by Greek resistance fighters, codenamed Animals, to suggest increased partisan activity in the Greek target area. Double agents were used to bolster the deception, most notably Andre Latham, a dodgy, high-living French aristocrat and career army officer, with a rabid loathing for communism who had been recruited by the Abwehr in Paris in 1942. Latham was introduced to the rest of his spy team in the Elizabeth Arden beauty parlour on Faubourg Saint-Honoré. A playboy called Dutte Maris, or possibly Dutte Arispe, a former French naval officer named Blondeau, and a pimp and saboteur called Dutte, who, unbeknownst to Latham, had orders from the Germans to kill him if he showed any sign of betrayal. The team had headed to Tunis with orders to gather information for the Abwehr. On May 8th, as the preparations for Sicily were gathering pace, Latham, athletic, middle-aged, of medium height, with grey hair and military moustache, presented himself to the head of French intelligence in North Africa, and declared his intention to spy against the Germans. He was given the code name Gilbert, and put to work sending false information to his German spymasters, who considered him an agent of very high class. Gilbert reported that a large invasion force was assembling at the Tunisian port of Bizerte, which was in fact composed of dummy landing craft, to divert attention from the genuine preparations. The Garbo network was deployed to muddy the waters still further. Agent 6 in Garbo's stable was Dick, an anti-communist South African recruited in 1942 by Puyol, who had promised him an important post in the New World Order after the war, if he would spy for Germany. Dick had been taken on by the war office on account of his linguistic abilities and sent to Allied headquarters in Algiers. Puyol supplied him with secret ink, and the South African was soon reporting back via Garbo to Kulental in Spain on preparations for the coming assault. The Germans were delighted with their new agent, Garbo's MI5 handler reported. To draw attention away from Sicily and further disperse the available German forces, Agent 6 speculated that on account of certain documents which had come to his notice whilst working in the intelligence section at headquarters, the landing would probably be made in Nice and Corsica. Soon after, Dick managed to steal some documents relating to the impending invasion and promised to forward these to Puyol, hidden in a packet of fruit. On July 5th, however, Garbo relayed sad news to Kulental. Dick's unmarried wife, Dorothy, had informed him that Agent Six had been killed in an air crash in North Africa. The Germans had lost a key spy, just as he was getting into his stride. This small tragedy was, of course, entirely fictitious. Dick and Dorothy did not exist— the invented spy had been terminated because of a real death. The officer who had been acting as scribe for Agent No. 6 met with a fatal air accident whilst returning from leave in Scotland. Dick had distinctive handwriting. 
MI5 debated whether to pretend that the agent had damaged his right hand, and was therefore obliged to write with his left, or to attempt to forge his handwriting. Neither option seemed safe, so Dick, the South African spy who never was, was summarily put to death. Despite the tight security surrounding the Sicilian campaign, and the vast clouds of disinformation thrown up by Operation Barclay and the double agents, German and Italian intelligence could hardly fail to spot the signs of an imminent invasion. The hospital ships assembled at Gibraltar. The eight million leaflets dropped over Sicily, warning that Hitler was a fickle ally, and that Germany will fight to the last Italian. Even more significantly, the fortified island of Pantelleria, sixty miles southwest of Sicily, surrendered on June 11th after a three-week bombardment in which 6,400 bombs were dropped. The assault on Pantelleria, Operation Corkscrew, was the obvious prelude to a full-scale invasion of Sicily itself, since its capture would furnish the Allies with an airbase within range of the larger island. In London, it was feared that the successful capture of the island would give the game away altogether. Double Agent Gilbert told his controllers not to be alarmed, as the attack on Pantelleria was merely a feint, and the real attack would come elsewhere. Even so, some on the German side correctly anticipated what was to come, and German messages deciphered at Bletchley Park suggested that the Germans were increasingly concerned about Sicily. Even Karl Erich Kulenthal, watching from Spain, began to wonder whether the plans detailed in the intercepted letters had changed. After the capture of Pantelleria, Kulenthal received increasing reports that Sicily would be the next invasion goal. Numerous reports to that effect were sent to Berlin, but Berlin discounted the validity of such information. Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, the canny German commander in the Mediterranean, had believed for six weeks before D-Day that the most likely point of attack would be Sicily. Yet, for the most part, the German high command appeared wedded to the belief that the main assaults would come in the eastern and western Mediterranean, while the assault on Sicily might still be a feint. The false picture of Allied strength painted by mincemeat and the other deception operations had left Germany attempting to mount defences across an impossibly wide front. Operation Cascade had successfully convinced the Germans that the Allies had some forty divisions available to participate in the offensive, almost twice the real figure, and could therefore easily mount two or more attacks simultaneously. In truth, the Allies never had enough landing craft for more than one operation. In the same way, the Allies' strategic thinking rejected the launching of an amphibious assault without adequate air cover. Realistically, this ruled out Sardinia and Greece as objectives for major landings. The two targets identified by Mincemeat were simply not on the genuine Allied agenda. The Germans never realised this. German intelligence was quite unable to tell the High Command where or when the main attack would come. Confusion and hesitation reigned as the Germans struggled to see through the murk of deception and their own flawed and limited sources of intelligence. The list of possible landing sites included not only Sardinia and Greece, but also Corsica, southern France and even Spain, while Hitler's fear of the Balkans coloured his every strategic move. In Sardinia, which the Japanese Chargé de Fer in Rome reported was still regarded as the favourite target, troop strength was doubled to more than 10,000 men by the end of June, and bolstered with additional fighter aircraft. At the critical moment in the Kursk tank battle on the Eastern Front in July, two more German armoured divisions were placed on alert to go to the Balkans. German torpedo boats were ordered from Sicily to the Aegean. Shore batteries were installed in Greece, and three new minefields were laid off its coasts. Between March and July 1943, the number of German divisions in the Balkans was increased from eight to eighteen, while the forces defending Greece increased from one division to eight. Despite Italian intelligence warnings that an attack on Sicily was coming, and urgent Italian calls for German reinforcements, no measures were taken to reinforce the island. As the official assessment of Operation Mincemeat later noted, it was never possible for the Germans to cease reinforcements and fortifications of Sicily altogether, as we might have changed our plans, and it was always too vulnerable a target. Yet the Germans clearly continued to believe that Sicily, if it were attacked at all, would not face a full Allied onslaught. At the end of May, an ultra-intercept from Kesselring's quartermaster revealed how woefully underprepared the German forces were. Rations for just three months 
and less than 9,000 tons of fuel. Confidence that mincemeat was doing its job rose higher still. Compared with the forces employed in Tunisia, this was a tiny garrison, one historian has written. Four days before the invasion, Kesselring reported that his troops in Sicily had only half the supplies they needed. Eisenhower's fears of meeting well-armed and fully organized German forces on the shores of Sicily were unfounded. Germany simply did not know what was coming or where, and by the time it became clear that Sicily was the real target after all, it was too late. The Allies, by contrast, had a clear-cut idea of Sicily's defences and the Axis' failure to reinforce them. The British and American invaders would face some 300,000 enemy troops, defending 600 miles of coastline. More than two-thirds of the defenders were Italian, poorly equipped and ill-trained. Many were Sicilian conscripts, men with little stomach for this fight, old, unfit, unenthusiastic, and, in some cases, armed with ancient weapons dating back to the previous war. The Italian coastal defence troops, according to one Allied intelligence report, suffered from an almost unbelievably low standard of morale, training and discipline. The German forces, some 40,000 men in two divisions, were made of more resilient material. The newly rebuilt Hermann Göring Armoured Division, three battalions of infantry, had seen hard fighting in Tunisia and was transferred to Sicily by Kesselring after the seizure of Pantelleria. The 15th Panzer Grenadier Division was a battle-scarred, war-toughened unit with 160 tanks and 140 field artillery guns. The Italian defenders would probably put up little resistance, it was predicted, but the Germans would be hot mustard, as one officer put it. Montgomery predicted with cold realism, it will be a hard and very bloody fight. We must expect heavy losses. Bill Darby was also expecting the worst, and rather looking forward to it. If casualties are high, it will not be a reflection of your leadership, the ranger commander told his officers. May God be with you. Chapter 21 A Nice Cup of Tea The weather forecast was grim, and the weather deteriorating as the great invasion force set sail. In Malta, Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham, naval commander in the Mediterranean, and the recipient of the second mincemeat letter, received the news that the flotilla had set off with more resignation than hope. The Admiral had recorded a message for the troops, to be broadcast on loudspeakers once the task force was underway. We are about to embark on the most momentous enterprise of the war, striking for the first time at the enemy in his own land. The upbeat tone contrasted with Cunningham's gloomy feelings as the flotilla set off into all the winds of heaven, with every possibility that the entire force might perish at sea. The die was cast. We were committed to the assault. There was nothing more we could do for the time being. Over dinner in the Malta headquarters, Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, the signatory of two mincemeat letters, was even more direct. It doesn't look too good. The weather steadily deteriorated and the wind began to bellow, creeping up to gale force seven. The troop ships lurched and bucked through the breakers, and boiling surf whipped into needle spray. Landing craft tore free of their davits and smashed into the decks. Cables snapped. The gale, some called it Mussolini's wind, screamed louder. Some soldiers prayed or cursed, but most lay in their hammocks, green and groaning, surrounded by the stench of vomit and fear. While all around him wretched, Major Derek Leverton of the 12th Light Anti-Aircraft Regiment of the Royal Artillery, jovial heir to a long line of British undertakers, played another hand of bridge with himself in the officers' mess, and happily munched the latest rations. We are now getting Cadbury's filled blocks, he told his mother. I had a peppermint creme and a caramello. Very nice. Derek, known to all as Drick, was thoroughly enjoying the show, as he referred to the invasion. He would have been happier still had he known of the small but important part played by his brother Ivor in paving the way for the invasion by ferrying a dead body to Hackney Mortuary in the middle of the night. Like Ivor, Drick had an impressible talent for looking on the bright side of everything, the consequence of being brought up in a family dedicated to dealing with death. It was a most excellent cruise, he wrote, describing the hellish trip to Sicily. Once we were clear of land, everyone was told the whole plan— Date, time, and everything. We had maps, plans, models, a copy of A Soldier's Guide to Sicily, and a copy of Monty's Message each. 
Drake was particularly impressed by the naval officer who briefed the troops on the strategic importance of Sicily. He was excellent. He looked like a masculine edition of Noel Coward. Major Leverton's task would be to set up his field battery on the beach and shoot down any enemy planes attacking the invasion forces. Leverton could not sleep. I went up on deck just before the sunset and could see the Sicilian mountains quite clearly in the distance. The wind was now dropping. The sea had been wickedly rough all afternoon, but it had now calmed down. I definitely believe it was a miracle. The soldiers had already set to work with chalk on the landing craft, on which were scrawled a variety of joking messages, day trips to the continent, and see Naples and die. Shortly before midnight, Leverton watched the heavy bombers passing overhead, followed by towed gliders packed with paratroopers for the assault. I was standing up on deck by myself then. I had previously often wondered what my feelings would be when the party started. I was disappointed to find that I had absolutely none. Although I was perfectly conscious that quite a lot of people I knew were about to be killed, and that I might be just about to kick the bucket myself, I wasn't really interested. I didn't feel excited or heroic or anything like that. I seemed to be watching a play. Drick trotted below for a final hand of bridge, rather a nice small slam, and another Cadbury Caramello. At the same moment, just a few miles ahead in the darkness, Bill Jewell was setting the stage for the next act of the play. Submerged, the crew had heard the noise of the e-boat propellers fade as the torpedo attack vessel moved off. After twenty more minutes of listening, the seraph cautiously resurfaced. The German boat was nowhere to be seen. Perhaps she was lying in wait for an ambush. If so, the two vessels would have to fight it out. The deadline was now less than an hour away. There could be no more diving. This time the boy had to be laid. The wind had dropped, but the sea was still choppy, making Jules' task of dropping the homing boy three times as difficult as it should have been. Just after midnight, the boy was hauled back on deck for a second time, and dropped at the precise spot indicated, one thousand yards offshore. Jewel now heard, for the first time, the low, thickening drone in the skies above, hitherto masked by the wind. Unseen planes, hundreds of them, were roaring through the dark skies overhead, the vanguard of the invasion. Invasion, that electrifying word. For the first time, Jewel wondered if victory might finally be in sight. The invasion of Sicily would be a long stride in the direction of Europe, and at least a short step on the road to Berlin, he reflected, if it succeeded. The same thoughts were echoed among the assault troops. An American journalist sailing with the 5th Division wrote, Many of the men on this ship believe that the operation will determine whether this war will end in stalemate, or whether it will be fought to a clear-cut decision. Jewel heard a series of loud explosions, and looking back toward the land, he could see great fires springing up in every direction. Those paratroopers who had survived the flight and the drop were now at work. At the same time, above the echo of detonations and the drone of aircraft, Jewel picked up another noise. The wind had now dropped completely, as it often does in the Mediterranean, and he could hear the faint throb of approaching engines. Italian coastal radar had also picked up the advancing fleet. Seconds later, a battery of searchlights from the shore turned night to day, and the British submarine found herself in the limelight. Their blindingly brilliant beams cut across the water and blended into a dazzling ball of light concentrated on Seraph. In normal circumstances, this would have been the cue to dive, but Jules' orders were to stay put until the flotilla arrived. The shore guns opened fire and for the next ten minutes, a nerve-tightening, shell-packed eternity, the seraph sat immobile as hell exploded all around her. The cook, crouched behind the three-inch gun, cursed eloquently. Each shell sent up a plume of water, and the lookouts huddled into the sides of the conning tower, as much to avoid the cascading water as to find protection from flying shrapnel. Between explosions, the throbbing beat grew louder. Then... Out of the gloom came a flicker of light from the leading destroyer of the mighty invasion fleet. Moments later the ships took on form, as dark shapes emerged slowly from the shadows. Forgetting the shells dropping around him, Jewel thought he had never seen anything so lovely. The English language needs a new descriptive noun to replace the hackneyed word armada, he wrote. As far as my night glasses would carry, I saw hundreds of ships following in orderly fashion. 
The destroyer searchlights now picked out the gun emplacements on shore, like footlights on a stage, and opened fire. Shells whistled high overhead. Enemy planes screamed over, dropping flares to aid the onshore gunners. Out at sea, Derek Leverton admired the flak pouring into the sky, with different coloured tracer and the shimmering light in the sky as the dry wheat fields above the beaches ignited. It was horribly beautiful. With flares, searchlights and blazing fires, plus the vivid chromatic effects of bomb bursts and shell explosions, all of Sicily, so far as the eye could reach, was like nothing in the world so much as a huge pyrotechnical show. The first destroyer passed the Seraph, her American crew cheering the stubborn little submarine. Moments later, a small landing craft approached with an American naval captain standing in the stern. Above the noise, he shouted, Ahoy, Seraph! The Admiral has sent me over to thank you for a great job of work. Jewel gave what he later admitted was a slightly astonished salute, but the captain had not finished his peroration. You know, those boys who landed are going to remember for a long time how you guided them in. This was the moment for the Seraph to slide warily back into the protective darkness. Jewel took a last look back at the shore, where tiny darting flashes marked the progress of the assault force as the Tommy guns blazed a path through the defenders. Bill Darby's U.S. Army Rangers had hit the beach at Kayla. Jewel hoped the friendly, ever-joking colonel would do nothing foolhardy. Leading from the front, since he knew no other place to lead from, Bill Darby stormed up the beach like a man possessed, which he was, through the defences and straight on to the town of Gala, much of which had already been demolished by the naval guns. Italian troops of the Livorno Division attempted to make a stand at the cathedral and were swiftly overwhelmed by the rangers. Darby personally held off an Italian counterattack by light Renault tanks, armed only with a thirty caliber machine gun mounted on his jeep. Realizing that something more substantial was needed, he ran back to the beach, obtained a 37 millimeter anti-tank gun, opened its ammunition box with an axe, and then, with the help of a captain, used it to blow up another Italian tank as it bore down on his command post. For good measure, he popped a grenade on the tank hatch, and its terrified Italian crew immediately surrendered. Some twelve hours into the invasion, Darby took a rolled-up American flag from his backpack and nailed it to the door of the fascist party headquarters in Gala's main square. After the Battle of Gala, Patton awarded Darby the Distinguished Service Cross and a promotion to full colonel. He accepted the medal and turned down the promotion again. Darby is really a great soldier, marveled Patton. To the east, Major Derek Leverton was taking the invasion at a more leisurely pace. Having wished my chaps good luck, all perfectly normal and matter-of-fact, the undertaker waited on deck to be called to the landing craft. As there was still a bit of time in hand, I went to sleep. Leverton holds the distinction of being the only man to doze off in the middle of the biggest seaborne invasion man had yet staged. There was, he recalled, quite a bit of banging about going on in the background, but Derek had no problem dropping off. As acts of heroism go, this very nearly compares to the exploits of Colonel Darby. It was getting close to dawn, and the hills could just be seen in silhouette when Leverton clambered into the landing craft. In a few minutes he was ashore after wading through the wreckage of gliders that had made slightly premature landings. Two dead paratroopers lay on the beach. Leverton was the last man to be upset by the sight of dead bodies. The first thing I was conscious of, he said later, was the delicious smell of crushed thyme. He and his men headed to the spot chosen for the gun emplacement, straight through a minefield. Occasional mines went off, making a hell of a row and a lot of black smoke. While his guns were unloaded, Leverton decided it was time for a cup of tea. His rations, he was delighted to find, contained tea, sugar and milk powder, which could be brewed simply by adding hot water. Most nourishing, appetizing and intelligent, thought Drick. Then he was dive-bombed. This, he told his mother in a letter, added zest to the party. As the bombs came down, I hopped down beside a stone wall. A lot of dust and stuff flew about, and when I got up I found a bit of stone as big as a football had been blown out of the wall a few feet from my head. Only an incurable optimist like Leverton could see the bright side of being bombed. Another bomb fell in the sea and splashed us with nice cool water. In case of further attacks, the undertaker instructed his men to dig little graves about three feet deep, which were most comfortable. 
The guns had still not been unloaded, so Leverton tucked himself up in his foxhole and went back to sleep. Unlike his nourishing nap on the boat, this sleep was less restful. I had rather an awful sort of dream of dive-bombing and so forth, and I woke up with a glorious sort of feeling that it was only a dream, when I realised it wasn't a dream and the blighters were just above me in their dive. The bombs caused only minor damage, although, as he wrote to his parents, the concussion in my grave jarred a bit. By nightfall, the guns were assembled and in action. To Leverton's satisfaction, one dive bomber was shot down on the first day. Over the next six weeks, eleven more kills would follow, plus quite a lot of possibles and damaged. Leverton was happy. Our chaps are very bucked at knowing we were the first battery to go into action in Europe since Dunkirk. It was hot on the beach, and organising the guns in long drill slacks and gaiters was sweaty work. I didn't feel I was suitably dressed for the job wrote Major Leverton. I therefore designed myself a utility invasion suit, consisting of a thin shirt, my blue Janssen swimming shorts, a pair of blue gym shoes, and a tin hat, an excellent and highly recommended costume. And so, as the bombs fell around him, this heroic British undertaker sat in his own grave, wearing his swimming trunks and a helmet, drinking a nice cup of tea. Mussolini was woken by an army colonel at six in the morning to be told that the invasion of Sicily was underway. Il Duce was bullish. Throw them back into the sea, or at least nail them to the shore. He had been right all along. Sicily was the obvious target. I'm convinced our men will resist, and besides, the Germans are sending reinforcements, he said. We must be confident. Never was confidence more misplaced. By the end of the day, more than 100,000 Allied troops were ashore with 10,000 vehicles. The Italian defenders surrendered in large numbers, often simply stripping off their uniforms and walking away or running. Sicilian cheers, not bullets, greeted the invaders in many places. The British Eighth Army had expected some 10,000 casualties in the first week of the invasion. Just one-seventh of that number were killed or wounded. The Navy had anticipated the loss of up to 300 ships in the first two days. Barely a dozen were sunk. The butcher's bill would be far smaller than Montgomery had feared, yet the invasion was still a bloody and chaotic affair. The airborne landings proved horrifically costly. Of the 147 gliders that set off from Tunisia, nearly half crashed in the sea, forced off course by strong winds and enemy flak. Just twelve landed in their assigned zones. The British held the bridge at Ponte Grande for seven hours, until the dwindling force of paratroopers ran out of ammunition and was forced to surrender. To the west, some 3,000 paratroopers of the 82nd Airborne Division were supposed to land near Gela, but ended up scattered by the storm across southeast Sicily, some as much as 60 miles off target. More than one in ten died in the first three days of fighting. Randall Harris, a sergeant in the Rangers, was one of the first onto the beach. He turned to see his company commander's chest opened up as if on a dissection table by a mine. I could see his heart beating. He turned to me and said, I've had it, Harry, then collapsed and died. Aircraft carrying a second wave of paratroopers were shot to ribbons by friendly fire from the ground, resulting in the loss of twenty-three planes. Stop, you bastard, stop! screamed war correspondent Jack Belden as the gunners opened fire on what they assumed were enemy planes. At least four American paratroopers, mistaken for Germans, were shot dead on landing. But amid the fratricidal confusion, deception and surprise continued to provide a vital protective armour. At eleven o'clock the previous evening, Andre Latham, Agent Gilbert, had sent a wireless message to his German handlers. Most important, have learned from reliable source that large force now on its way to Sicily. Invasion may be expected hourly. He was only telling the defenders what they already knew for the first major alert had reached Italian coastal units several hours before Jewel dropped his homing boy. By then, it was far too late for the defenders to make adequate preparations, and the bombing of the Sicilian telephone network ensured that many units remained unaware of the attack until it was well underway. Some went to bed, assuming the enemy would not be so rash as to attack in the middle of a storm. The Italian commander in Sicily was fully expecting an attack, Indeed, the Italian intelligence services were never as taken in by the deception as their German counterparts, yet owing in part to Operation Derrick, the secondary deception, the assault was expected in the west, not the south. As predicted, the response of the German divisions, stationed inland, was more vigorous. 
But by the time the Germans counterattacked on Sunday, July 11th, crucial hours had been lost, and the Allied beachhead was firmly in place. Spitfires attacked the Luftwaffe's Sicilian headquarters, disorienting what remained of German air defences at the crucial moment. Field Marshal Kesselring had sent the 15th Panzer Division to intercept the expected invasion in the west of the island, leaving the Hermann Göring Panzers to absorb the brunt of the assault. The Germans did nothing to hide their disgust as the Italian troops melted away and the coastal defences collapsed like sand castles in a hurricane. A message to Berlin, sent on the day after the landings, reported the complete failure of coastal defence and noted sourly that, on enemy penetration, many of the local police and civil authorities fled. In Syracuse, the enemy landings gave rise to plundering and rioting by the population, who accepted the landings with indifference. So many Italians surrendered in the first two days that the long lines of prisoners impeded the advancing troops. Kesselring complained that half-clothed Italian soldiers were careering around the countryside in stolen lorries. At 5.15 on the afternoon of D-Day, Kesselring ordered the Hermann Göring Armoured Division, At once and with all forces, attack and destroy whatever opposes the division. The Führer has ordered all forces to be brought into operation immediately in order to prevent the enemy from establishing itself. The German tanks could not break through. Some 43 were destroyed in bitter and bloody combat. The commander of the Göring division conceded, The counterattack against hostile landings has failed. The German tanks rumbled north to continue the fight inland. General Patton, screeching around the battlefield in his jeep, called it the shortest blitzkrieg in history. Montgomery agreed with him on this, if nothing else. The German in Sicily is doomed, absolutely doomed. He won't get away. The conquest of the island was just beginning, and more ferocious fighting was to come. But the Sicilian D-Day was over, and won. Chapter 22 Hook, Line, and Sinker A loud cheer erupted from Room 13 as the news of success in Sicily broke. Chumley performed the shuffling dance and a strange ululation. Auntie Joan Saunders wiped her eyes. The strain of waiting had been almost unbearable. As the success of Operation Mincemeat became clearer, Montague privately feared his part in the war might be coming to an end. Even if I have once brought off something really important and worthwhile, I'm never going to be allowed to do anything of the kind again. The pressure had left the planners hollow-eyed, in Montague's words, too keyed up to read a book or to get to sleep. Looking back, Montague recalled the flooding relief as the Allies surged through Sicily. It is really impossible to describe the feeling of joy and satisfaction at knowing that the team must have saved the lives of hundreds of Allied soldiers during the invasion, a feeling mixed with the delight that we had managed to do what we said we could do, and what so many of our seniors had said was impossible, and what I have always thought even Churchill really thought was only worth trying as a desperate measure. For Montague, a special pleasure lay in the subsequent discovery that Hitler himself had fallen for the phony documents. Joy of joys to anyone, and particularly a Jew. The satisfaction of knowing that they had directly and specifically fooled that monster. The deception had succeeded beyond every expectation, and Montague was jubilant. We fooled those of the Spaniards who assisted the Germans. We fooled the German intelligence service both in Spain and in Berlin. We fooled the German operational staff and supreme command. We fooled Keitel, and finally we fooled Hitler himself, and kept him fooled right up to the end of July. The operation had also been gratifyingly economical. One specially made canister, one battle dress uniform, some dry ice, the time of a few officers, a van drive to Scotland and back, about sixty miles added to HMS Seraph's passage, and a few sundries, about two hundred pounds at most. There was no grand celebration over the success of Operation Mincemeat, no return to the Gargoyle Club with Montague and Jean Leslie playing the parts of Bill Martin and his beloved Pam. Montague's wife Iris, perhaps prompted by the dark hints from her mother-in-law, had announced that she was returning from America with the children. Montague knew that Hitler was still planning to unleash pilotless flying bombs on London, and that the capital remained deeply unsafe. Since this information came from Ultra, however, he could not tell Iris. The most I could do was make vague references to Hitler's last fling, but this made no impression on her. 
It was probably not Hitler's fling that worried her. Iris and the children returned to London while the invasion of Sicily was underway. The reunion was a joyful one. The photograph of Pam in her bathing suit, lovingly signed, was swiftly removed from Montague's dressing table. Montague could not yet explain what that was all about. Perhaps this was just as well. Secret messages of congratulation flooded in from those who had touched or been touched by Operation Mincemeat. Dudley Clark, the cross-dressing maverick behind A-Force, wrote, I do congratulate you most warmly on the success of your M operation. It was very remarkable and a fine piece of organization, and whatever the developments may be, you have achieved 100% success. General Nye also applauded the planners. It is a most interesting story, and it seems it was swallowed hook, line, and sinker. Frank Foley, the celebrated MI6 officer who had helped thousands of Jews to escape from Germany before the war, told Montague that the operation had been the greatest achievement in the deception line ever brought off. In his diary, Guy Little celebrated, Mincemeat has been an outstanding success. There was already talk of medals for the framers of Operation Mincemeat. Johnny Bevan and Ewan Montague had spent months at loggerheads, but to Bevan's great credit, he insisted that both Montague and Chumley deserved formal recognition, albeit secretly. From evidence at present available, it appears that a certain deception operation proved a considerable success and influenced German dispositions with all important strategical and operational results. The fact that it achieved such very successful results must be attributed in large measure to the ingenuity and tireless energy on the part of these two officers. Montague had pushed the operation through by force of personality, while Chumley was the originator of this ingenious scheme and was responsible, in conjunction with a certain naval officer, for the detailed execution of the operation. Both men, Bevan recommended, should receive a similar decoration, since each seems to have played equally vital parts on the plot. Montague was so delighted by the success of Mincemeat that he proposed a sequel. A plane carrying the Polish Prime Minister in exile, Vladislav Sikorsky, had crashed on takeoff from Gibraltar on July 4th. Six days later, on Sicilian D-Day, Montague sent a note to Bevan pointing out that papers from Sikorsky's aircraft are still washing up and likely to reach the Spanish shore, and suggesting that this might be an opportunity to plant some false documents among the debris. The object would be to show that mincemeat was genuine, and that we are going to attack Greece, etc., and that we only delayed it and switched from Brimstone, Sardinia, to Sicily, because we suspected that the Spaniards might have shown the papers in mincemeat to the Germans. Mincemeat, too, was vetoed by Rushbrook, the director of naval intelligence, because the Germans could not be expected to fall for the same ruse twice. Not worth trying. The Spaniards will know that everything of importance has been recovered, and a valuable secret wash-up could have no verisimilitude. The success of the Sicily invasion could not, of course, be attributed to Operation Mincemeat alone. To an important degree, the deception plan reinforced what the Germans already believed. Every element of Operation Barclay, of which Mincemeat was but one strand, tended to back up that misperception. Moreover, the comparative weakness of German forces in Sicily reflected Hitler's mounting doubts about Italy's commitment to the war. Sicily was a strategic jewel, but it was also an island, physically separated from the rest of the Axis forces. If large numbers of German troops were committed to defend it, but Italy dropped out of the war, they would be isolated, and Sicily would become, in Kesselring's words, a mousetrap for all German and Italian forces fighting down there. Yet up to, and even after, the invasion of Sicily, the effects of mincemeat lingered on in German tactical planning, slewing attention to the east and west. The night before the attack, Keitel had distributed a most immediate analysis of Allied intentions, predicting a major Allied landing in Greece, and a joint attack on Sardinia and Sicily. Western assault forces appeared to be ready for an immediate attack, while the eastern forces appeared to be still forming up, he wrote. A subsequent landing on the Italian mainland is less probable than one on the Greek mainland. Half the Allied troops available in North Africa, Keitel predicted, would be used to reinforce the bridgehead which would be established in Greece. Ultra-intercepts showed that four hours after the landings, 21 ground-attack aircraft took off from Sicily, which was now under attack, heading for Sardinia, which was not. 
The same day, the Abwehr in Berlin sent a message to its Spanish office stating that the high command in Berlin were particularly anxious that a sharp lookout should be kept for convoys passing through the Straits of Gibraltar, which might be going to attack Sardinia. It gave, as a reason for these orders, that the high command appreciated that the attack on Sicily was possibly only a feint, and that the main attack was going to be elsewhere. That assessment, naval intelligence noted with satisfaction, was entirely consistent with the mincemeat story. The same effects were visible at the other end of the Mediterranean, where the fictional attack on Greece was directly undermining Germany's ability to repel the genuine attack on Sicily. The R-boats, or Raumbote, were 150-ton minesweepers, and a key component of German naval strength, used to pick up mines but also for convoy escort, coastal patrol, mine laying, and rescuing downed air crews. On July 12th, Sicilian D-Day plus two, the commander of German naval forces in Italy cabled headquarters to complain that the departure of the first Arboat Group, sent to the Aegean for the defence of Greece, had prejudiced the defence of Sicily, as the Gala barrages were no longer effective, the shortage of escort vessels was chronic, and the departure of any more boats, as ordered, would have a serious effect. Yet the belief in an impending Greek attack remained rooted. In late July, Rommel was dispatched by Hitler to Salonika to take command of the defence of Greece, if and when the Allies attacked. The Abwehr laid intricate plans in anticipation of the expected assault on Greece, including teams of secret agents and saboteurs to be left behind if the Germans were forced to withdraw. The recriminations on the Axis side started almost immediately after the invasion. When he heard that the Italian coastal defenders had failed to repulse the attack, Goebbels muttered darkly about macaroni eaters, but refrained from pointing out that he had never quite believed in the Abwehr's great intelligence coup. Hitler never admitted he had been fooled, but his military response to the invasion was proof enough that he knew he had made a major strategic error in failing to reinforce Sicily. Hitler's own reaction was immediate. He ordered two more German formations, 1st Parachute and 29th Panzer Grenadier Division, to be hurried to Sicily to throw the invaders into the sea. Again it was too late. Others within the German hierarchy realised that they had been sold a fantastic and extremely damaging lie, and responded with fury. Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Nazi foreign minister, demanded a full explanation of why Major Martin's documents, indicating that the attack on Sicily was a decoy, had been so blithely accepted as genuine. This report has been proved to be false, since the operation directed by the English and Americans against Sicily, far from being a sham attack, was of course one of their planned major offensives in the Mediterranean. The report from a wholly reliable source was deliberately allowed by the enemy to fall into Spanish hands in order to mislead us. Von Ribbentrop suspected that the Spaniards had been in on the ruse all along, and ordered his ambassador in Madrid, Dikoff, to conduct a full-scale witch-hunt, undertake a most careful reappraisal of the whole matter, and consider in so doing whether the persons from whom the information emanated are directly in the pay of the enemy, or whether they are hostile to us for other reasons. Dikov blustered and tried to swerve out of the way. The documents had been found on the body of a shot-down English officer, and handed over in the original to a counterintelligence here by the Spanish general staff. The documents were investigated by the Abwehr, and I have not heard their investigations cast any doubt on their authenticity. Rather weakly, Dikov argued that the enemy must have altered its plans after losing the documents, the English and Americans had every intention of acting in the way laid down in the documents. Only later did they change their minds, possibly regarding the plans as compromised by the shooting down of the English bearer. Von Ribbentrop was having none of it. The British Secret Service is quite capable of causing forged documents to reach the Spaniards, he insisted. The deception had been intended to persuade Germany that we should not adopt any defensive measures— or that we should adopt only inadequate ones. With the Allies storming through Sicily, he wanted names, and he wanted heads to roll. It is practically certain that the English purposely fabricated these misleading documents and allowed them to fall into Spanish hands so that they might reach us by this indirect route. The only question is whether the Spaniards saw through this game, or whether they were themselves taken in. The finger of suspicion pointed at Admiral Moreno, 
the double-dealing navy minister, and at Adolf Klaus and his Spanish spies. Further up the chain of command, it cast a shadow over the Abwehr in Spain, and the intelligence analysts in Berlin who had verified the fakes. Who originally circulated the information? demanded von Ribbentrop. Are they directly in the pay of our enemies? Karl Erich Kulenthal was also in the firing line. After the invasion of Italy had actually taken place, Berlin reprimanded the Abwehr office in Spain for having failed to submit adequate data. Kulenthal, as adept at escaping blame as he was skilled at gathering credit, kept his head down until the storm passed. He must have known that the documents passed to Berlin back in May had been proven entirely misleading, but he said nothing. Kulenthal watched the invasion of Sicily with mounting consternation, but at least one of his fellow intelligence experts, who had played an equal role in facilitating the fraud, may have witnessed the unfolding of events with secret satisfaction. Not until July 26th, more than a fortnight after the landings in Sicily, did Alexis von Werner, head of FHW and secret anti-Nazi conspirator, issue a report stating that, at present at any rate, the attack planned against the Peloponnese had been given up. Von Werner was too canny to acknowledge that the letters were fakes. He merely asserted, like Dikov, that the plans had changed. In Hitler's world, there was no room for an honest mistake. 